Sally, he's right there. all stand together and let's join Joni on that chorus there. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of Kings is He. The Lord of Lords supreme through all eternity. The great I am the way, the truth, the life, the door. Talk about Jesus, the King of Kings is He, the Lord of Lords supreme through all eternity. The great I am, the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus. hymn book with me and turn to page number 234 page number 234 crown him with many crowns crown him with many crowns the lamb upon
last second he's quicker than I thought and uh, <laughs> he didn't go down I caught him but he he, he he got a little scared so anyways we appreciate brother Mark and Miss Joni leading leading the music tonight and uh, appreciate all of you being here uh, let me make a couple of announcements but beforehand let's go to the Lord in prayer it is good to have our good friends the Gutierrez family here with us this evening and uh, we're all familiar and know brother Caleb and Miss Erica and their kids and and uh, Brother Caleb, would you pray for us? Amen. All right. You can be seated. Once again, good to see each of you here uh, this evening. Let me just make a couple of announcements. Uh, I told you Sunday that if you could be on a mowing crew, then uh, help us out with that. And many of you did. I appreciate that. There are sheets in the back. Uh, Maddox. I'm going to sit with him tonight while Brother Mark preaches. But uh, there are sheets in the back that uh, have each crew. All four crews on here, the crew leader and the dates that you'll be cutting. And so if you signed up, grab one of these, and then there's a sheet with your responsibilities uh, as well. And uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, as far as any other announcements, nothing really pushing right now. Uh, but uh, we'll, if we can think of anything, then, then we'll certainly uh, let you know here in just a moment. Brother Mark will be preaching tonight, so he needs no introduction, obviously. He needs no introduction. He'll be busy real soon and so we wanted to hear him one more time before he uh, got real busy as you know he's had uh, a few, quite a few weeks off now he has started back he's been gone for a couple of weeks now but he uh, had the night available and he'll start back Sunday and so I'm not going to take the time to introduce after the song service of Brother Mark when we finish singing then you come on up here all right Brother Mark We are just going to have to have two song leaders tonight because we don't want any more face plants. <laughs> page number 96, remain seated. Turn your books to page 96. All hail the power of Jesus' name. number 168 page 168 I love this song who is he in yonder stall 
page 168. shepherds fall who is he in deep distress fasting in the wilderness tis the lord a wondrous story tis the lord the king of glory at his feet we humbly fall crown him saw Mark Jr. crawling under the piano. Well, I do greet you in the lovely name of the Lord Jesus tonight. It's good to be back in church, isn't it? Let me, let me, let me just feel this for a minute. Let me take a deep breath. It's good to be back in the house of God. I'm just playing now. Glad to see each and every one of you. Glad you could be here tonight and make it be among us as we've gathered here in the Lord's house to worship Him. And I want to thank you for all that you did during this interim period where we have been, I would say inactive, but I believe that I'm a stockholder in Lowe's now. <laughs> I made so many trips. I had a hard time figuring out why we couldn't come to church and I could go over to Lowe's and there was no such thing as social distancing. I'm not being critical. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying I went so many times. Joni had so many projects for me. I told her I got to get back out on the road so I can get some rest. <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, it is, uh, 
it is good to be back in the house of the Lord. During those eight weeks, I guess, eight, I guess about eight weeks, uh, uh, I had uh, eight, well, I had five cancellations, and then I had three postponements. And uh, since then, those postponements have rescheduled. Uh, but uh, our church stepped up in a grand way, in a great way. And I want to thank Brother Wes, and I want to thank you for all that you did to help, help, help us out during that time. Uh, it, it, uh, it is so very much appreciated, and we couldn't have made it without you. And I want you to know that we're very grateful and very thankful. Thank you for doing what you did. It's very much appreciated. And pray for us. We're uh, in May. I started back. I had a meeting the first week of May, and then the next week canceled. They canceled out in Clifton, Texas, and then uh, and then last week I was in New Albany, and then uh, uh, Sunday I was out in Stafford with Brother Larry, and then here tonight, and then Lord willing, this weekend I'll head out for Texarkana, a little old town called Sims. And uh, so you pray for us as we we make those journeys that God will give us the message and that we'll be used of Him. I don't know how much time that we all have left. I don't know. But whatever we have, I want to use it well. I want to use it well for the Lord and for His His glory. I just wanted to thank you, though, tonight for all that you did. I know I've sent out notes, and and uh, I know Brother West got those. I'm sure he read those to you. But I wanted to express my own uh, feelings, my own heart to, uh, tonight to you. If you have your Bibles, look with me to the book of Micah tonight, chapter number 7. Micah chapter number 7. Now, I would give you a page number, but I'm not using a Schofield Bible tonight. I will repent when I get home and immediately make a promise never to do that again. But uh, I'm not using a Schofield Bible tonight. And, uh, and so... I can't, t can't tell you the page number, but it is Micah chapter 7. Now, I'm going to take this coat off, not because I'm planning on getting all lathered up or anything, but I'm, gonna, I'm just a sweater. I am. I just sweat. So we're not, I'm just going to take it off. Johnny just bought this suit for me, and I don't want to soil it too badly. Uh, cleaner told me one time, said, I don't know what you do in those suits said, but I'm going to tell you one thing, that there's a glue in that, in that inner part of your suit, and when you sweat real bad, it comes loose, and he said, there's no use cleaning it, it just wrinkles up. I told what Johnny what uh, the cleaners told me, I said, well, I guess we better plan on buying a lot of suits then, so, because I don't have to do what I do, you know, raise my voice, sweat, whatever. I don't have to do that to sweat, I, I'm just going to sweat. Book of Micah, one of the minor prophets, one of the minor prophets. But like the rest of the minor prophets, they all have a major message. They all have a major message. Uh, the messages are short, but the messages are to the point. And the messages are very powerful. Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah, and we all know well Isaiah the prophet in the time of his prophecy to the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom. And while Micah's ministry was centered in the, to Judah, the southern kingdom, his message was concentrated towards Samaria. And you do know Samaria was in between Galilee in the north and Judea in the south. And Micah's message, his message was concentrated towards Samaria. He prophesied of both the first coming of the Lord and the second coming of the Lord. But here in chapter 6 and chapter 7, Micah is addressing the condition of the nation of Israel, specifically Samaria, uh, prior, directly prior to the first coming of the Lord. When the Lord was born in Bethlehem, when he came into this world as a, li as a lamb. And so Micah directs this message towards that part of the land of promise, uh, towards those people 
and uh, just right before the Lord came and was born in Bethlehem's manger, Micah yields this message. The interesting thing about it is that what we see in Samaria here, according to Michael's, Micah's, I'm calling him Michael, Micah's message is very similar to the condition that we see in our nation today. For instance, uh, when Micah addressed these people, there was a lot of moral corruption. Look in verse number two. Let me show you this. The good man has perished out of the earth. There is none upright among men. They all lie and wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. It's very evident that Micah is talking about a time when there's a lot of moral corruption in the nation, a lot of moral corruption among these people. But not only was there moral corruption, there was also political corruption. Look at verse number three. Look what he says there in chapter seven. He said, that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asketh, and the judge asketh for a reward, and the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. That's describing political corruption, political corruption. Boy, don't we live in a day similar to that right now? A day of moral corruption, a day of political corruption. And just like these conditions existed before the first coming of Jesus Christ, these conditions exist today before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not only was there moral corruption and judicial or political corruption, but there was social corruption. I don't know if they had social distancing or not, but they did have social corruption. Look what it says in verse 5. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in in a guide, social corruption. I mean, no trust uh, among even friends. No trust among men and people. No longer were they a people of their word. There was also marital corruption. Why, look what he goes on to say in verse number five. He said, keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. And then, of course, there was relational corruption. Verse number six says, for the son dishonoreth the father and the daughter riseth up against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies are the men of his own house. Boy, what does that sound like? Why, Jesus himself even said that in the days that he was preaching, in the days that he was speaking to the people of Israel. But here what we see, dearly beloved, is that the nation of Israel in general is in a malaise directly before the first coming of our Lord to this earth. But I like what, uh, I like what Micah says here in verses number 7 and verse number 8. You see, as bad as it is to Micah, it's not a hopeless situation. You know, we need to come to the place, dearly beloved, where the world and the conditions about us does not dictate our actions and our attitude. We need to come to the place in our life, my dear friends, tonight, where God and His Word and His Spirit living within us determines or dictates our actions and our attitude and not the circumstances that are around us. Because in spite of all these things, look what Micah says here in verse number 7 and verse number 8. Therefore, or in light of, he said, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I love that. Micah's saying, yeah, it's bad. It's probably as bad as it's ever been. Micah was magnifying the, the, uh, Micah was magnifying the sin of their day. Yet in spite of those things, Micah refused to be a part of the problem he was determined to be a part of the solution. 
Micah refused to allow himself uh, to, uh, to be put under the circumstances, but to rise above them in order that he might be a shining light in a dark time. That's really my heart tonight. It's dark out there, as you all know it. We all know it. I tell you, I, we're living in unprecedented days. And in spite of what we see, dearly beloved, on the surface, I, I, I believe what we're seeing today is just the, 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 the surface of the mystery of iniquity. I believe that forces are at work to uh, try to take this world and, and plunge it even further into darkness. But that doesn't alarm me near as much as the attitudes that we as Christians can fall prey to if we're not careful. I know the coronavirus is here. I know quarantine is here. Our lives have been upset and shaken up. Our lives are anything but the normal of what we're used to. And I know it's very wearing on us mentally and emotionally and even spiritually. And I, I hope you're not like me because I tend to be a negative person. I know that's hard for you to believe, but I tend to be a negative person. And sometimes if I'm not careful and I fall into that vein of negativity, there's just nothing good going on. What concerns me is sometimes that comes out in my preaching. But you know something, dearly beloved, while there may not be a whole lot of good going on out here, there ought to be a lot of good going on in here. Because I guarantee you there's a lot of good going on up there. Amen? There's a lot of good going on up there. And sometimes when I get that way, I think probably the most harm I do, other than to myself, is to others who are watching me. Maybe my family, maybe my children, maybe my grandchildren. Maybe my friends or co-workers or, or people, dearly beloved, who are watching me and looking on me as I react to the circumstances and situations. And whereas, dearly beloved, I ought to be a light that points them to heaven. I ought to be a light that points them to Jesus. I ought to be a light that tells them that no matter what's going on around us, you and I have something to rejoice in. You and I have a reason to smile. You and I have a reason to laugh and you and I have a reason to praise him because in spite of all these things, God is still God. And as Brother Olaf used to say, he's good all the time. He's good all the time. I don't know if you fought it, but boy, I've fought it. As this thing has steamrolled and gotten bigger and bigger, I've, I find myself fighting a critical attitude. I've found myself majoring on things that I suspect and I believe but may not be necessarily the situation that's going on. And as a result, sometimes I want to talk about politics and sometimes I want to talk about, uh, I, I want to talk about the, uh, the circumstances of our country and what's going on and and what I want to emphasize to you tonight, dearly beloved, you can do that, but I'll guarantee you, it won't do a whole lot of anybody any good. It won't do you any good. It won't do the people around you any good. It won't do God's people any good. And I'm going to tell you something else. It won't do the world any good. Oh, we need to be realist. We don't need to have our eyes closed. We, we need the wisdom of God, and we need understanding of the times that we live in, and we don't need to be deceived about those things. While all this is going on, we need to remember that it's still the will of God for us to point people to Jesus. It's still the will of God for us to magnify Him and to speak of Him and talk of Him so that others might see Christ in us. You know, He's still saving souls. He's still changing lives. He's still the same yesterday, today. And forever. But Micah says, here's what I'm going to do. In spite of all these things that are going on. And by the way, he's vexed about it. Verse number one, look what it says. Woe is me. 
For I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits as the great gleanings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit. Micah's vexed. As a matter of fact, the word there that he uses, woe. The Hebrew word means this. It means to bewail or lament. Micah's heart is broke. Whether he's weeping with his eyes or not, I know not. But I know in his heart he's weeping and his heart is broke because he looks at the land that belongs to God and he looks at the land that belongs to God's people and they've turned their back on him. And Micah is weeping and he's wailing. His heart is broke. He is lamenting. And rightfully so. I mean, as we look around us, dearly beloved, at the corruption in our land, there ought to be some things that break our heart. As we look at the sin that abounds, dearly beloved, it ought to drive us to our knees to pray. As we look at these things, it ought to be to us, even as it was to Lot in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses number 7 and 8, where the Bible said that Lot's righteous soul was vexed because of the ungodliness of of the days in which we live. His righteous soul was vexed. The, the conditions about him laid heavy upon his heart. And, and it ought to be that way with us today. But it doesn't mean it should rob us of our joy. It doesn't mean we should lose our victory. It doesn't mean that we should get so negative that we can't see the silver lining in the dark clouds. It doesn't mean that we need to be so focused upon it that we lose our testimony and we lose our ability to affect lost people who are watching us. And to that end, <coughs> Micah makes this statement, therefore, here's what I'm going to do. I mean, Micah's thought about this thing. Micah has dwelt on this thing. Micah has meditated on this thing. And he's made up his mind, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not going to live underneath the circumstances. I'm going to rise above these circumstances. You know, the whole thing with the book of Ecclesiastes is about perspective. The whole thing with a lot of the, what Solomon says in the book of Ecclesiastes is about his perspective of life and his perspective is under the sun. Instead of over the sun and above the sun and beyond the sun, Micah's perspective of life, or excuse me, Solomon's perspective of life is what he sees down here. And you know something, dearly beloved? If you and I can't look above and beyond that, it can be depressing to you and I. It can take us down and we'll become real negative and we'll have the wrong attitude and spirit. Instead of the church being at its best, when the world is at its worst, it'll be quite the opposite. But here's what Micah says in verse 7, Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. You know what we need to do in days of corruption? You know what we need to do in days like this? And boy, that is where we're living. I don't know what you think about all of this, but boy, to me, it's magnified Ephesians chapter 6. It's magnified those things that are against us. It's really magnified it. But I want you to understand this tonight, dearly beloved, and that is we need, to, we need to, like Micah here, what we need to do in the face of all these things is maintain perspective. We need to maintain the right, or excuse me, perception. Well, look what he says, Therefore will I look unto the Lord. It's real easy, and boy, I'll tell you what, I've gotten to where I've probably watched more news in these last eight weeks than I've watched in a long time. And after watching all this news that I haven't watched in a long time, I realized why I wasn't watching it. But boy, if you sit and listen to that and you get to looking at all this stuff, I'll tell you, you'll just, you'll find yourself waking up in the morning and going to bed at night and just existing through the day with a grudge against all these people. I'll tell you, you can live that way if you want to, but I don't want to live that way. I struggle with that enough. I fight that battle enough. I, I need the right perception in times like these. It reminds me of what the songwriter said. In times like these, we need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. 
Be very sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. And in times like these, like the times that Micah speaks about here, we need the right perception. And what is it? In Micah's words, I'm going to look unto the Lord. I'm going to look unto the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, and you all know this verse. In verse 1, he says, Seeing we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And then he said in verse 2, looking unto Jesus. I love what Mr. Spurgeon said about that verse. He said that looking there is not just a casual glance, but it is a concentrated gaze. He said, dear Christian friend, that's exactly what the Christian life is. It's one long look at Jesus. Boy, if you're going to keep the right spirit, if you're going to maintain victory in your Christian life, if you're going to maintain the joy of the Lord, get your eyes off all this stuff that's going on around us. Get your ears off of what man is saying. Look above the sun and beyond the sun. Look away to Jesus and look unto Jesus tonight because he's the author and he's the finisher. He's the one who started it and he's the one who will finish it and he's the one who will carry us. All the way through. Listen to David's perception. David at a hard and difficult time in his life. In Psalms 121, in verse 1, he said this, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. He says, my help cometh from the Lord. Like I said, it's bad. Looking at the Nation of Israel looking at Samaria specifically, he said, it's bad. There's moral corruption. There's all kinds of corruption. And sometimes Micah might have felt like he was a failure. Sometimes he might have wondered if he was having any effect at all. I know and I say to preachers all the time, sometimes we might feel like we're beating our head against the wall. Sometimes we might even wonder if it's worth it. Sometimes we might even wonder if anybody's even listening. But the truth is, dear preacher friend, we don't do what we do because of the results. We do not do what we do because of the way people react or whether they obey or not obey. We do what we do because we're looking at Him. We love Him. Amen. He's the one who called us. And for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross, despised the shame. But it was a joy to do the will of God. Micah says, yeah, it's bad. It's bad. But I'm going to maintain the right perception. I'm going to keep my eyes on the Lord. I, therefore, will I look unto the Lord. I'm going to tell you every morning when you wake up, his mercies are new. I want you to understand every day you wake up and the night when you pillow your head, he's still on the throne. I love that little old jingle I just heard from heaven and this one thing I know. My sins, they're all forgiven. He's washed them white as snow. The load that I once carried, he took away somehow. I just heard from heaven and it's all right now. And it is, folks. It is. You say, well, preacher, there's a coronavirus. Yeah, and there's a crown of righteousness. You say, preacher, people are dying. Yes, sir, but he's living. You say, preacher, uh, the economy is messed up. It, people are losing their jobs. People are starving. All this is going on. Yes, sir, yes, ma'am, but with every tick of the clock, we're getting closer to the sound of the trumpet. We're getting closer to seeing him who is all together. We just need to maintain the right perception. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. And I got to tell you tonight, I can't see him with these naked eyes. I cannot see him with these human eyes. But I'll tell you, I can see him with the eyes of faith. I can see him with the eyes of the heart. I see him in this word right here. 
as I open it and read page after page, psalm after psalm, proverb after proverb, book after book, every page that I open, I see Jesus. I see him in this world, my friend, as, as things that are going on right now are a fulfillment of the prophecies of time. I see him working in people's hearts and working in lives. Why, I would have to close my eyes not to see him. We need to maintain the right perception. I'll tell you something else. We need to maintain the right kind of patience too. We need to be patient. Look what he says here. Verse 7. He said, I'll look unto the Lord and I will wait upon the God of my salvation. You say, man, it, look, it may look like the devil's winning and God's losing. It may look like we got the short end of the stick. But I'm here to tell you, it's not over yet. By the way, it's not about us and whether we're winning or losing. It's really all about him, amen, and that his will be done in, on earth as well as it is in heaven. But Micah says here, he says, I will wait upon the Lord. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, if you would, just for a moment. Paul said this. Paul made this statement to these Thessalonian believers. Someone had corrupted these people's understanding of the coming of Christ. And Paul writes these two uh, epistles to the Thessalonian church to correct their theology about his second coming. And look what he says. And look what he says to them in verse number 9 and 10 of chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. By the way, folks, that's what salvation is. You know what salvation is? It's repentance and faith. That word turn there, you can't turn from some, to something without turning from something. He's describing their salvation experience. He's talking about their repentance and their faith. They turned from idols to serve the living and true God. And then what were they to do? And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. We may go through malaise here, and we may see corruption here, and we may go through trial and tribulation here. But know this, my dear friend, one day when we stand on the other side, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Amen? This world's not our home. Abraham pitched a tent and lived in a tent. We don't need to drive stakes down here. We're not home yet, brothers and sisters. Don't get discouraged. Don't become impatient. And because of your impatience, draw back, or as the book of Hebrews says, to cast away your confidence. Just wait on the Lord, because I assure you tonight, he has the final word. Oh, Isaiah's great verse in chapter 40, verse 31 of his prophecy, and we all know this verse. He said, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. Then he said, teach me, Lord, to wait. One of the human deficiencies that we all struggle with is impatience. We struggle with impatience in life. And one of the areas that we struggle with impatience is in the spiritual area. We pray for things. We, we want it now. We begin to go through a little suffering. We want it to cease now. And the truth is, dearly beloved, sometimes that suffering is allowed by God and sometimes that suffering is sent by God to condition us to come to the place where we learn that the goodness of the Lord in life is not everything always working out the way that we want it to work out but the goodness of the Lord in life is to know that in the midst of it all that he's there, that he's near, that he never leaves us nor forsakes us. Oh, don't you love him tonight? Micah says, yeah, it's bad. And it is, folk, it's bad out there. 
I've been doing a lot of reading of different periodi periodicals and, and even getting on the internet and reading things. I really am convinced we're living in the last days. I really am convinced that we're seeing the beginning of the end. You know, you read Matthew chapter 24. And you see all the things. In Matthew 20, chapter 24, he's not talking about the rapture of the church. He's talking about the second coming of the Lord to this earth. And as the sun sets on that generation, and as the sun sets on that age, these shadows, these signs begin to rise and become prevalent in that 24th chapter. And the very first signs he mentions are famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. You know, I've been noticing that in the last few months, two months, I've noticed more high-level earthquakes in America than I've ever seen in my lifetime in a short period. Utah, Wyoming, and of course California. That doesn't surprise anybody. But I mean three in a row, and all of them were above five on the Richter scale, and just another one this past week. Pestilence. Look at this coronavirus. For the first time, you and I have seen a pestilence that's not only impacted our country, but the whole world. The whole world. Think of this tonight. For the first time in the history that you and I know, the city of Damascus is in malaise. Right now, Russia has its army and its air force in the city of Damascus not too far from Megiddo, not too far from the old King's Highway, the Mesopotamian Highway, not too far from the possibility of the battle described in Ezekiel 38. You know what Jesus said about this in Matthew 24? He said, this is just the tip of the iceberg. He said, all this is just the beginning of song. Just the beginning. I really believe that we are living in that generation that very well could see the coming of the Lord. And boy, the temptation, and I'm not even going to get into some other stuff that I've read, but boy, the temptation, the temptation is to fear. I'm so glad Jesus said so many times, fear not. You know why? Because he knows we have that tendency to do so. The temptation is to be overwhelmed sometimes. But I'm here to tell you, dearly beloved, what we need to do is realize that, that I, this world isn't our home, that we're looking for Jesus to come. And even if he doesn't come, we're waiting upon the Lord to give us direction, to show us what to do, to give us the grace, to give us the strength that we need to stay focused upon him. Micah says, yeah, that's bad. I'm just going to maintain the right perception. I'm going to look unto the Lord. I'm going to maintain the right patience. I'm going to wait on him. And I'm going to maintain the right prayer. Look what he says. He says, my God will hear me. Hear me. I've been reading a lot about prayer here lately. Boy, Dr. Leonard Ravenhill had some tremendous things to say about prayer and some of the things that I've been reading. And I'll tell you if this epidemic or pandemic, whatever you want to call it, what's going on about us ought to do anything. It ought to drive us to our knees. I wondered, you know, when 9-11 happened, I saw our churches fill up for a few weeks. Been watching since this happened. And what concerns me is I'm not seeing the same fervor that I saw back in 2001. Maybe I'm missing it. I don't know, but I, even in our churches, I travel and go different places. I'm not seeing that hunger and thirst for God, even though it was seasonal that I saw then. But I'll tell you, dearly beloved, if this thing ought to do anything, it ought to drive us to our knees. Jesus said in Luke 18 and 1 that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Ought always, whether there's a coronavirus or not, whether things are bad or not, men ought always. Can I say tonight, dearly beloved, there's never a time we don't need God. We need him in the good times. We need him in the bad times. 
And by the way, the good times can be bad times if we don't keep it in proper perspective. Let me just point out three things that I know we need to be praying about right now. Number one, we need to pray for those who are in authority. Pray for your president. Pray for your president. Boy, if anybody ought to ever feel like a voodoo doll, it ought to be President Trump, I guarantee you. But you need to pray for him. Listen to these words, and you know these words. You can turn there with me if you want to. But in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, he said, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority, that they may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. That's one thing we need to be praying for right now. We need to be praying for our leaders. We need to be careful, folk, and I'm probably the world's worst. I mean, I don't even need to be repeating some of the things I've said about some of our leaders in light of this thing. But we need to be careful about our attitudes and spirits. You know, Jesus died for them. Jesus loves them. Hey, folks, listen to me tonight. The most important thing right now isn't even what's going on. The most important thing is for the will of God to be done. The most important thing is for you and I to magnify the Lord in our attitude, in our actions. The most important thing is that we point people to Jesus in this time. So we need to watch our attitudes and spirits and in, in, in light of what's going on, one thing that we need to pray for is those who are in authority. I'll tell you another thing we need to pray for and that is for God's will to be done. You remember in Matthew 6 verses 9 and 10 in the model prayer, Jesus started it off by saying this. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to be praying for God's will to be done. Hey, folks, God didn't wake up in February sometime and go, Oh, there's a virus. Didn't take him by surprise. He knew all about it. He knew about it before anybody else knew. Whether he sent it or not, he allowed it. And God has a very specific reason, and God has a very specific purpose. And when you know what we need to be praying for, Lord, may your will be done. Maybe God is allowing this to get the church's attention. Maybe God is allowing this to drive us to him. Maybe God is allowing this as far as you and I are concerned to purge us uh, of the apathy and the complacency that's in our lives. I don't know. But we need to be praying for his will to be done. I'll tell you something else we need to pray for. We need to pray for strength. In Hebrews 4 and 16, and we quote it often, the writer put it like this, let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help us. Grace to help us in time of need. In time of need. I got on the airplane the other day to fly to Memphis. I got to tell you, if you do fly now, I thought, man, I better get there two hours early instead of an hour and a half early. I got there two hours early, Brother Bob, and I'll tell you what, there wasn't a line First time since TSA came to existence, I got in line and nobody else was in line. I go to the back and sit and Joni texts me. She said, what does it look like? I said, I'll send you a picture. It looked like the midnight shift and all the flights had come in and they were cleaning up. And this was 6 o'clock in the evening. I get on the plane. I didn't have to worry about somebody sitting next to me and crowding me. I had both seats all to myself. The plane wasn't even half full. And I sat there and had a mask on. It was one that Joni made for. You know, you don't have to wear the mask in the airport, but you do have to wear it on the plane. And I put that mask on, and I'm sitting there going, <gasps> I thought, dear Lord, if there is a coronavirus on this plane, it sticks on this mask. I've got it. I'm sucking it in like a wind tunnel. 
Man, I got so thirsty. They're not passing out cold drinks. They're not passing out peanuts or pretzels. I'm like, boy, this is persecution. <laughs> Finally, they pass us out bottles of water, and I look around. I pull that top off that bottle, and I drop that mask. <laughs> I put it down and put the mask back up. <laughs> oh, oh, my, we need grace to help us. I don't know about you, but I'm a very negative person. And I'm not just trying to magnify, you know, personality traits like optimism and pessimism. I'm just a negative person. I mean, when things go wrong, nothing's right. The world is against me. And it gets like a snowball going down the hill. And the whole time that's happening, my children are listening to me. My wife, my friends, and I'm not doing anybody. Matter of fact, I'm picking up people going with me downhill. That's what I'm doing. And I'm plunging them into the same darkness that I'm in. You know what I need to do? I need to look unto him. I need to keep the right perception. I need to look unto him. I need to wait on him. I need to be patient. David, the writer of the book of Psalms, especially that Psalms 27, he said, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Boy, I need to stay on my face before God and say, oh God, help me. Give me the grace that I need. But then, not only the right perception and patience and prayer, but I need to maintain the right persistence. I like what he goes on to say in verse 8. Rejoice not against me, Oh, mine enemy. When I fall, look what he says. I shall arise. I shall arise. You know what Paul's saying? Yeah, I'm going to fall, but I'm just going to get back up. I'm just going to get back up. I don't know if y'all have ever watched those Rocky movies. I have. And in Rocky IV, he fights that big old Russian. I forget his name. I think his name was Gorbachev. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> See, if you're listening. <laughs> Drago or somebody. I mean, first part of that fight, you'd have thought Rocky's done. I mean, Drago's knocking him down with every other, every other shot. Rocky's hitting, he's hitting, he's hitting the canvas. But you know what he kept doing? Just kept getting back up. You know, that's what Paul said. Proverbs, Solomon said this. He said in Proverbs 24 and 16 that a just man falleth seven times, yet riseth up again. I believe it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me look over here real quick. I didn't plan on using this, but it just came to my mind. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, I believe it is, in verse number 5, I believe. He says this. No, that's not it. Wrong one. Shouldn't have gone there. But Paul talked about how many times, I believe it's in Acts 21, that's where it is. He'd been shipwrecked. He talked about all the times that he, the things that he had gone through. And boy, I love what he said there. But none of these things moved me. I just stood my ground. You know, there in Ephesians 6, you know, that word against is used again and again. And so often in the, in the preaching I've heard, uh, the emphasis there is, is what we're against. But you know, that's not the emphasis of that. The emphasis is not what we're against, but what's against us. You know what Paul's saying there when he says stand? He's saying hold your ground. Just get back up. You get knocked down, you get back up. Christian friend, we're going to get knocked down. We're going to get up in spite of the, what I preached tonight, in spite of what we've heard, in spite of what we know. We're going to get knocked down. We're going to get discouraged. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fall on our face. But you know what we need to do? We need to get back up. I love what Micah said here. He said, don't, don't rejoice against me, my enemy. He said, I will rise. I may be down now, and things may be bleak now, and things may be dark now, but I love what he said here. He said, I shall arise when I sit in the darkness. The Lord shall be a light unto me. 
Talk about moral corruption. I filled out, by the way, I got my Medicare card this month. And what amazes me is I'm excited about it. Didn't know quite know what to think when I first got it. Then I signed up with a supplemental insurance policy and I had to fill out this form. And for the first time, it asked me if I was male or female, and then they had two other categories there. Well, that made me mad. I wanted to call the insurance company up. I didn't. You'd be proud of me now. I held myself. Moral corruption. We live in a day where people don't know what gender they are. Political corruption. Political corruption. We live in a day, dearly beloved, when people are so partisan, they don't care how bad they have to hurt the American people to get their agenda done. Political corruption? Social, social corruption? I mean, we, we, we look around us, dearly beloved, and we not only see these social ills and the social problems that have been caused by this virus and the political ramifications, but we see, dearly beloved, the, difficult, the difficulties that... that in the culture all about us, the, uh, the condition of people's lives in general. Marital? I mean, if I were to give you the statistics, it would probably shock you, shock us all, and you'd probably even know them. Family, relational, all of these things. And if you and I are not careful, we can so look at those things, and those things can get so big in our lives that we'll lose sight of him and we'll develop an attitude and spirit that won't help anybody and certainly won't even help us. But I'm here to tell you, last time I checked, he's still on the throne. Heaven is still there. The Bible is still the word of God. The cross is still the power of God unto salvation. The Holy Spirit still lives within us. We are more than conquerors through him that overcome. I'm ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed of myself. God help me. In these days, I don't know if you feel like I do. But sometimes I just want to go to Washington and drain the swamp. you know what? There's only one person that's going to drain the swamp and he's coming again. It won't be Trump. It'll be King Jesus. And what we ought to be doing is praying even so God, Lord Jesus. But until then, our hearts will go on singing until then with joy I'll carry on until the day mine eyes behold that city until the day God calls me home. I don't want people to say, how's your day going, Mark? And and I growl at him. I want to say, God is good, you know. <laughs> He's good. And I praise his name. You know, I, I added up what I got in meetings last year during this period in time. And because of Parkwood Baptist Church, did you know I made more money this year than I made last year? Which that sounds bad. I, I don't make anything anyway, but... But I just, you know, and I told my wife, I said, you know what we need to do? We just need to stop and praise him and thank him. Because he's not changed. And it's the same for every one of you in here tonight. Get your eyes off all this. Stop complaining about all this. All it'll do is take you down. All it'll do is it'll, it'll muzzle your soul. Get your eyes off.
Let's talk about Jesus. The King of kings is he. The Lord of lords supreme through all eternity. Father, bless your word tonight. Thank you for it. Bless our people. Help us in these days. We need you more than ever. We need you more than anything. Forgive us of our short-sightedness. At least forgive me, Lord. I, I can't speak for these people. In this room sits some of the greatest people I know. But forgive me of my short-sightedness. Forgive me, Father, of being focused on myself and my circumstances. Help me to look unto you. And I'll be careful to give you all the praise and thanks for asking in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Wes, you want